Okay, so far we've covered some critical infrastructure hacks and how devastating those can be, but what about a hack that's devastating in a way that doesn't really cause mass panic? For this episode, I'm rewinding back to 2014. Let me set the stage for you. We're currently toward the back half of Barack Obama's second term as president. In terms of geopolitical conflicts, America is currently involved in the war on terror, civil war in Syria, and North Korea has been leading some short-range missile tests that are starting to cause concern. On the entertainment side of things, Marvel's had a good year. They released Captain America, the Winter Soldier, and the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Okay, do I have you back to your 2014 mindset? Good. Now, let's hold on to that entertainment side of things, because we're going to Hollywood. Well, close to it. Specifically, we're heading to Culver City, where Amy Pascal, the co-chair of Sony Pictures Entertainment, is on her way into the office. It's November 24th, and it's around 8.30 in the morning. I don't know about you, but back when offices were a part of daily life, the first thing I'd do upon signing in was check my email. And Amy, well, she had the same idea, but when she sat down at her desk, what she saw was a rather tacky-looking graphic of a red skeleton, with text over the top. The text read, Hacked by hashtag GOP. Warning, we've already warned you, and this is just the beginning. We continue till our request be met. We've obtained all your internal data, including your secrets and top secrets. If you don't obey us, we'll release data shown below to the world. Determine what you will do until November 24th, 11 p.m. GMT. Followed by links to a couple instances of the same zip file being hosted online. Now, I've put this picture up on our Instagram feed, at shell underscore pod. So, when you go look at it, I can see why Amy's first reaction was to assume this was a prank. Unfortunately for her, it was not. This was the beginning of quite possibly the largest entertainment industry hack to have ever happened. So, come with me as we watch this hack play out like a bad movie, and I explain what the shell happened to Sony Pictures Entertainment. The whole world is being given a glimpse inside a major Hollywood studio as a relentless electronic hacking attack continues against Sony Pictures. The FBI is launching a probe into the massive Sony Pictures hack. Who or what is responsible, James? That is a great question. At this stage, we don't know. Business Insider says Sony executives promised the movie studio will recover from a massive cyber attack. Before we dive back to 2014, I'm going to let you know that while we explain the fallout of this hack, I'm going to break it into the course of a couple different periods, each lasting around a week, followed by the more technical specifics of how it actually happened. Because by the time this is mostly said and done, it'll be in the middle of January 2015, and each week or so has its own grab bag of juicy details, both in terms of leaked data and in terms of what actually happened. So let's step back into it. But... This time, we're going to take a focus off Amy while she tries to figure out what's going on. Because it's not just her. That picture? It was starting to appear all over Sony, and it wasn't something they could quietly ignore. That morning, on the r slash hacking subreddit, someone posted a screenshot of the image titled, I used to work for Sony Pictures. My friend still works there, and sent me this. It's on every computer, all over Sony Pictures nationwide. This was starting to make its way into the public eye. And by the end of the day, this would be the most talked about news story. The biggest question on everyone's mind was, who is the GOP? Well, it turns out GOP stood for Guardians of Peace. This designation had a lot of national news outlets asking if the Guardians were what's called hacktivists. A hacktivist is pretty much what the name implies, someone who hacks for a cause they believe to be righteous. So... We have these Guardians of Peace, and we know they have Sony data, but we don't really know what they want at this point. And what's in those zip files? Should Sony even be concerned at this point? To answer that, let's go back over to the hacking subreddit. The first thing I want to do before we move on is to say that the hacking subreddit is a place for hacking news, questions, and the culture behind hacking. It's a very positive community where I frequently participate. There are some common misconceptions by posters that you can post your illegal hacks or ask them to hack something for you, but the moderators do a rather amazing job at nipping those in the bud. So, it's a very tight-knit community, 
with a passion for hacking. Legally, of course. Well, users on the subreddit decided to take a look at the files. Since they had the screenshot with the links, they could just download it themselves. What they found were three text files. One labeled README, and two titled List 1 and 2. The README is directed to the Sony employees itself, and it says, These two files are lists of secret data we have acquired from Sony Pictures Entertainment. Anyone who needs the data, send an email titled to the Guardians of Peace to the following email addresses. And there was a list of emails that were partially censored on the subreddit for good reason. This was the first indicator that GOP stood for Guardians of Peace. And in the list files, well, it was quite a hefty list of file names that they were saying they had possession of. Some of the heavy hitting stuff, if they actually had it, included private keys that enabled access to secure systems, Excel files, likely made by employees, of passwords, and financial documents. The three that I found kind of interesting out of this list, well, they allegedly had copies of Cameron Diaz and Angelina Jolie's passports, the entirety of the budget, and, ironically, the insurance information and course of action for cyber breaches. Probably not great to have that out there. Picture this now. Sony is at risk of all their information being leaked to the public. But not just the public, their competitors. They can change passwords, rotate keys, but the world is about to know what they're planning and what they're spending on it. Sure, it wouldn't really be ethically right to take it, but I can't really imagine some competing studios would ignore this kind of information. These files being specifically named proved that there was a pretty credible threat here and that these files were actually in possession of the hackers. It's one thing to say they have them, it's another to list every single one of them out. The following few days, not a lot is confirmed, and speculation is running rampant with who the GOP could be. The top three suspects seem to be either hacktivists, a disgruntled employee, or North Korea. You're probably thinking, wait, like, the country? Why would they do something like that? Well, we're already in 2014, so let's walk it back a little bit further, and go back to June, when a movie trailer was released. Look at this. Kim Jong-un wants to do an interview with Dave Skylark? He's a fan! Look at him! If that ain't a real story, what is? Okay, let's do it. We're going to North Korea! Mr. Rappaport, I'm Agent Lacey with Central Intelligence. You two are going to be in a room alone with Kim. We got the interview! The CIA would love it if you could take him out. Hmm? Take him out. Like for drinks? Like to dinner? Take him out in the town? No, uh, take him out. You want us to kill the leader of North Korea? Yes. What? I won't go there. Hello, North Korea! Preceding the interview, you will shake Kim's hand with a fatal dose of poison. It is critical that you touch nothing. <laughs> I think there's a zero percent chance of this working. Is it on my ass? Yes. It, I sat on it. You have to secure the payload. What do I do with it? What do I do with it? There are people coming. Where's my hide it? What if you hide it in your butt? I don't want to stick it in my ass. You got to put it in your butt right now. It's a little big. They are closing in on you. Package is secure. Remember that movie? It wasn't really a major hit, but it wasn't bad. I remember renting it on YouTube because I was super excited to be able to watch a movie on YouTube that had just come out. Well, while that may have been a pretty run-of-a-mill release for us, turns out this didn't really tickle the folks over at the North Korean government. They came back pretty quickly calling this movie an act of war after a trailer was released. A new Hollywood comedy dealing with an assassination plot against North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has caught the attention of Pyongyang. It warned that the release of the film, which is due out in the fall, would be an act of war. The co-director of the movie says Pyongyang is overreacting. Kwon Shuan reports. Could a comedy movie trigger a war? According to a North Korean foreign ministry spokesperson, yes. North Korea has come out all guns blazing against the first-ever American movie dealing with its leader, Kim Jong-un. 
The interview is an action comedy that centers on how a talk show host and his producer, played by James Franco and Seth Rogen, embark on a CIA mission to assassinate Kim. Rogan, who also co-directed the movie, says he was inspired by journalists making trips to the communist country and hypothetical discussions on how they would be in the ideal position to assassinate the world's most dangerous people. But as can be seen in the trailer, the movie is hardly sinister in nature. However, it was enough for North Korea to call the movie an act of terrorism and an act of war. Pyongyang's foreign ministry spokesperson threatened merciless retaliation if the film is released. The government in Pyongyang denounced the interview as, quote, undisguised sponsoring of terrorism, as well as an act of war, in a letter to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. North Korea promised decisive and merciless countermeasures if the U.S. administration tactically improves or supports the Seth Rogen written and directed comedy. Sony, kind of rightfully so, ignored the comments and moved forward with the film's December 25th release date. I think a lot of us were familiar at the time of the kind of peacocking threat structure that came out of Pyongyang. So when this threat was made without any kind of specifics about consequences, I think most people just chopped it up to another bout of threats and kept going on their day. Alright, with that background, what would you think at the end of the first week? Is it a hacktivist group looking to put the pain towards the capitalist machine? The disgruntled employee may be looking to get back for a company's potential mispractices? Or did an entire nation state decide to put resources toward hacking a movie studio? I actually remember some of my thoughts from this at the time. I was a low-level network security guy back then, and I remember initially thinking it was a hacktivist group, but the only thing I could really recall that didn't sit well with me at the time was the amount of data they allegedly had on just regular employees. To me, if you are a hacktivist group or a disgruntled employee, it wouldn't really be on brand to target the average company goers, which made me lean more towards the North Korea theory. Between that and the backlash they gave for the trailer, it kind of seemed like it at least added up to a good story to me. With that, we closed the first week or so of this hack, and we entered December of 2014. This was a first week where things really started to escalate. On December 1st, the FBI confirmed that it was working with Sony to investigate the attack. This would also instill the first official notice that North Korea might be involved in the hack. Meanwhile, the attackers were moving forward with their threats as well. This time, they started by releasing the salaries of 6,000 of Sony Pictures employees on a site called Pastebin, which is a frequent dumping ground for leaked and hacked credentials. In those 6,000, the top 17 executives had their salaries leaked. Some of the more notable ones included Michael Linton, the CEO, and Amy Pascal, the co-chair who we talked about earlier, receiving a base salary of $3 million a year. Doug Belgrad, the president of Columbia Pictures, who at the time made a base salary of $2.35 million a year. And Clint Culpepper, president of Screen Gems, possessor of a rather fun last name, and person who made a base salary of $1.8 million a year. The remaining executives of those top 17 all had base salaries of at least $1 million a year. Apparently, this breach of privacy was enough to warrant Linton and Pascal's first official response as well. In an internal company-wide memo, they called the situation a brazen attack on our company, our employees, and our business partners, adding that, quote, the release of employee and other information are malicious and criminal acts, and we are working closely with law enforcement. That would be the first, but it certainly wouldn't be the last time Amy had to deal with this in a public light. At the same time, the Guardians of Peace were already moving forward with their next course of action. On Friday, December 4th, the employees at Sony Pictures would yet again walk into work to be greeted with another surprise. This time, it was not a spooky skeleton, though. It was a simple but threatening email from Guardians asking employees to sign against Sony. They stated that Sony was only a part of a bigger plan, with more to come. Anything that would happen to the employees would be because of Sony's fault. To me, what was the most worrisome thing, though, was the way it closed. And I quote, Our supporters take their action at any place in the world. Many things beyond our imagination will happen at many places of the world. Our agents find themselves act in necessary places. 
Please sign your name to object the false of the company at the email address below if you don't want to suffer damage. If you don't, not only you, but your family will be in danger. Poor grammar aside, that's a pretty scary email to receive, and I wouldn't blame some of the employees if they responded back just to try to get some peace of mind. Still, at this point, North Korea is denying the involvement. But they're starting to be a bit more brazen in their response, calling the hack a righteous deed of supporters that want to put an end to U.S. imperialism. Again, in this statement, they call out specifically that movie, The Interview, and how it was a film equivalent to a terrorist attack that would belittle the North Korean government. Following that string, it's not super surprising that, of the data released so far, some of it included emails and salaries of staff on that movie and its stars, James Franco and Seth Rogen. Attention had only been ramping up for those two, and that Saturday on Saturday Night Live, Franco actually addressed the situation himself. Thank you very much. I'm James Franco, actor, poet, artist, dude. So something pretty crazy happened this week. Uh, I have this movie called The Interview coming out with Seth Rogen at Sony, and this week Sony Studios got all their computers hacked. This is true. These hackers have leaked real personal information about everybody that works with Sony. Social security numbers, emails, and I know eventually they're going to start leaking out stuff about me. So before you hear it somewhere else, I thought it'd be better for you to hear it from me. Soon you'll know that my email is cuter than Dave Franco at AOL.com. <laughs> My password is little Jamesy Cutie Pie. <laughs> and this is all just a real violation of my personal life. You know, James, oh. it's uh... <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's actually it's much, much worse than we thought it was gonna be, man. What? You're not gonna believe this, but uh, an hour ago they released uh, some of our private photos from our phones. What? <laughs> oh my god, what which photos? All of them. Okay, maybe it wasn't the most serious way to address it, but he actually did it. That would close out the second week of fallout from this attack, with seemingly not a lot really slowing down. The worst was to come, though, as the next bit of time I'm going to cover is going to go straight through to Christmas, but this one would be anything but jolly. Another leaked set of data was released, this time branching out to more celebrities. The hackers would reveal celebrity aliases online to the world. The fake names used by Natalie Portman, Tom Hanks, Daniel Craig, and other A-list stars are exposed to the public at this time. And the email inbox backups they'd attained are leaked, showing some of Sony's dirty laundry to the world, and broadcasting some of their internal plans. Within the inboxes of several executives, people started to look around and pick out these titles to really kind of spread around as the kind of information that was there. Sony lost the Steve Jobs movie to Universal after Amy Pascal and Scott Rudin got into a pretty heated email exchange. Scott Rudin bashed Angelina Jolie as, quote, a spoiled brat with a rampaging spoiled ego. He also called Megan Ellenson a bipolar 28-year-old lunatic and implied that she needed to take her meds to get the production off the ground. This is one of the movie's producers, David Fincher. He lied to Amy Pascal about dropping out of a jobs project. Do you remember the show Community? Well, after Sony canceled it, apparently Joel McHale asked for a discount on a Sony TV. And lastly, Sony had said in a couple emails that they were looking to do a 22 Jump Street and Men in Black crossover movie, which I'm very sad still has no plans to be released or produced. They also talked about doing a Captain America and Spider-Man crossover, which led to Captain America Civil War, where we first saw Spider-Man enter the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and an animated Spider-Man movie from the Lego movie creators. That would end up being Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and that one Currently, it's getting a sequel. Emails and gossip weren't the only thing released, though. Another warning from the Guardians of Peace came about. We have already given our clear demand to the management team of Sony. However, they have refused to accept. It seems you think everything will be well. If you find out the attacker while not reacting to our demand, we are sending you our warning again. Do carry out our demand if you want to escape us. 
and stop immediately showing the movie of terrorism, which can break the regional peace and cause the war. You, Sony, and FBI cannot find us. Kind of some stuff like Anonymous Fair, but at this point, it's becoming a little more clear that the involvement of North Korea could be a possibility, given the comments on not showing the movie of terrorism and North Korea's rather similar statement with regards to the interview. Still, Sony hasn't really backed down from the interview and are starting to show the premieres prior to the widespread release. A road bump would come in the form of another threat, though, from the Guardians of Peace on December 16th. They alleged that a 9-11 style attack would occur on any theater that screens the interview. And while the Department of Homeland Security says that there was no credible evidence that this would happen, many theater chains pulled the movie and the East Coast premiere was cancelled. Ultimately, the interview would be somewhat crippled by this, landing in only 330 theaters. However, it did manage to get a decent viewing in the form of a digital release. I know digital releases are rather popular right now with a litany of streaming services offering this during the pandemic, but at the time this was still new ground. So on Christmas Eve, Google Play, Microsoft Xbox Video, and YouTube Movies all debuted the film for only $6. Kinda wish we had those prices now. While all this is happening, Amy Pascal and Michael Linton were still doing damage control. They had to assuage the fears of their employees, do damage control on leaked documents and emails, and effectively treat this like a 24-7 job of disaster recovery. And boy, did they have to focus on recovery. Because it would end up taking the better part of the entire year of 2015 to get things back on track. It's estimated that the fallout from the hack cost Sony $15 million in that fiscal quarter alone, on top of a $6 million settlement to help all the employees who are now dealing with identity theft due to their information being leaked. Amy Pascal would end up leaving her position after this happened, moving down to a production deal and stepping out of the co-chair role after such a big compromise. The Sony documents themselves remain searchable to this day, because Julian Assange, the creator of WikiLeaks, housed the entire archive as a searchable database contending that it was important and newsworthy due to it being the center of a geopolitical conflict. So, while Sony is spending the better part of 2015 trying to sort this side of it out, let's look back into the US government response here, because the FBI has been looking at this, the NSA has been looking at this, and it's starting to become a widespread topic. 2014 would end with Pyongyang continuing to deny involvement, but the US government officially defining North Korea as the threat actor who carried out the attack. Even though their involvement was denied by North Korea, the U.S. took official action in the form of sanctions. President Obama signed an executive order imposing these increased sanctions on North Korea in response to the Sony hack. The sanctions were broadly written and allow the Treasury Department to block any North Korean official or agent from accessing its assets or entering the United States. The White House called the sanctions, quote, the first aspect of our response, and they weren't lying. Since then, even more sanctions have been levied against North Korea for their continued cyber response. However, at the time of those sanctions, there were still deniers out there that believe North Korea may not have been as directly involved as they believed. So, how did the government come to this conclusion then? Well, one of the major shifts started with an FBI warning about defending against what's called a wiper malware. Wiper malware does pretty much what you might think. It wipes the hard drives of the machines it's on, and in this case, it would replace the background with a specifically loaded bitmap image. At the time, wiper malware was actually pretty rare to see in use against the United States, with it mostly being popular in the Middle East and Asian Pacific. Well, cybersecurity company Trend Micro had an interesting discovery. They claimed to have recovered samples of the malware that was used in this alert, and within it was the exact same background that was found on the employee machines, the spooky red skeleton. So, now that we have a known good sample of a malware, a more thorough investigation can begin. And let's start looking at how the malware worked. After all, how can we attribute blame if we don't really know what we're looking at? At this time, the delivery mechanism is still kind of unsure, but some of the more common tactics for getting malware onto a device include things like phishing emails, or physical compromise by putting a USB into a computer. So, 
The malware arrives in what's called the dropper, or a wrapper. This itself is the package that installs the malware and any files it needs to keep working. The way this particular one worked was that it disguised itself. You see, on the back end of your computer, Windows has dozens and dozens of little services that run all without you noticing to keep things going on your machine. These services all have varying level of access to your device and exist to make sure the stuff you see works as intended. So this malware disguised itself, trying to look like one of those services to avoid detection. Once it was on the device, it tried to create a network share. And then it would give that share unrestricted access, meaning that any other computer on the network can see it and access it. Then using that network share, it used an internal Windows tool to try and run code to spread itself to any other machine that could see it. That's where we get the quick spread to nearly every employee that we saw early on, and would end up on Reddit. Now, after we have a way for it to move around and established, it still needs to function. So the next thing it does is try to disguise itself yet again, but as a different Windows tool. This part of the malware basically set up each computer to launch that graphic with the skeleton of the demands. Alright, so at this point in the analysis, we have the way it moved around, we have the threat, but not the exact theft and damage of data. That comes next. So, then an exe file gets run. The title of that file is basically gibberish, but what it does is make a couple copies of itself first, and then launch each of them with different parameters. Each of these parameters would trigger a different part of the application to help come together into one big picture. Lastly, at this stage, it shuts down the service for Microsoft Exchange, making email effectively inaccessible. This means that if someone wanted to report malware at that point of the game, they'd need to call it in manually over the phone, while also hoping whoever they were calling wasn't impacted and dealing with the same exact problem. The final stage of a malware takes us back to the wiper title. It makes the connection back to the server the attacker's own, and once prompted, starts to delete all the files on the hard drive, piece by piece, until everything is gone. Then, on its way out, it suspends Windows for two hours and reboots the machine. Upon a full reboot like this, all the files will be wiped, and we're back to where we were on November 24th, with Amy Pascal looking at her computer in confusion. There were some tough cells on attributing the blame, though, so let's take a look at those next. The first hard cell was the actual infrastructure used to make the attack. The FBI was able to analyze the malware and identify several IP addresses that the malware would communicate with. The addresses belonged to a group of North Korean businesses operating out of Shenyang in the northeast area of China. This piece of evidence is tricky though, particularly to IT professionals, because IP addresses can be rotated, meaning the owners of the addresses in prior attacks might not be the same ones they are now. But it is, however, kind of hard to ignore the repeated attacks from the same place and its alleged owners. Another big red flag to some was the fact that the data was actually released, instead of being held on to like is more typical in a nation-state attack. The continued dump of data led some to believe that this was actually a hacktivist trying to stick it to a major corporation, instead of a nation-state holding on to data and trying to get as much money as possible. To that end, even if it wasn't a hacktivist writing the code and performing the attack, it's also possible that a hacktivist group paid for the attack to take place on the dark web. Attacks can be bought and traded there, so it's entirely possible that some group paid for this and it ended up being North Korea that followed through with the delivery. The people who paid for it might not even realize that it would have been North Korea. The last big red flag I'll point out is how quickly we got to North Korea being blamed. It took roughly three to five weeks to officially attribute blame and in cases similar to this, you'd have expected it to take months. It might have been the nature of this being much more in the limelight with celebrity impact, but for the FBI to get to this conclusion in such a short period of time, even former Air Force Intelligence Officer Robert M. Lee was skeptical. He stressed that this kind of work, at this kind of speed, is rather unusual for interagency work, and when it does happen, it can easily be tainted by outdated or inaccurate information due to conflicting intelligence reports. Alright, so we've covered why it might not have been the North Koreans, but let's look at the evidence showing it could be them now. We'll start by going back to the malware. The thing about coding and about malware is that when someone or a group of people produce projects, there are often patterns. 
Every programmer has their own preferences. Things like how they name their variables, do they use tabs or spaces, and many more identifying signatures. Even still, it's also pretty common to find code reuse across projects. If you already wrote code that did a specific task and you need it again, you wouldn't rewrite it, right? Well, there were these same kinds of similarities between the Guardians of Peace and prior known North Korean attacks. It was revealed here that they had similar coding structures, similar encryption algorithms, and even the way they deleted data was similar. It's the equivalent of when you're watching Law & Order and they're talking about how the crime fits the MO of a serial killer. They used that pattern and were able to attribute the code to hacking groups originating in Pyongyang. What might be one of the bigger slip-ups that point to North Korea being the culprit was actually with regard to the Guardians of Peace social media accounts. When you're hacking, one of the first things you learn is to disguise your traffic. You wouldn't want to attack something right from your home network because it could lead right back to you. So you either use infrastructure somewhere that you aren't, or you use a VPN to disguise the traffic coming from your device and route it for somewhere else in the world. Well, apparently there were instances where when someone logged into the Guardians of Peace Facebook page, they did not do this. And the addresses that were being registered here were coming from North Korean networks, which are notoriously locked down. Former FBI director James Comey said it's really hard to imagine someone hijacked these particular addresses given how in control of that range the North Korean government is. That kind of points to it meaning on some level that the government at least knew what was happening. A belief that was also shared by NSA director Mike Rogers. At the end of the day, the US did end up attributing the attack to North Korea, but specifically to one of our hacking teams called the Lazarus Group. And even more specifically, it pointed out one citizen named Park Jin Hyuk. This same group, they had noticed patterns from in the past, ranging from cryptocurrency attacks, attacks carried against South Korea, and more. It was clear that the Lazarus Group wasn't something that existed just to ruin a pillar of the entertainment industry. A country like North Korea, that's constantly getting sanctioned on it, with few major economical allies outside of China, really needs a way to make money. So stay tuned, because next time, I'll go into the full history of what the Lazarus Group does for North Korea, and how it makes money, and why it continues to be a problem to this day. I'm John Cordes. Thanks for joining me while I explain what the shell happened to Sony Pictures. And I really hope you'll enjoy next episode where I explain who the shell of the Lazarus Group is. Thanks again to everyone who's listening. I'd like to ask anyone listening to follow the show on at shell underscore pod on either Twitter or Instagram. Or if you're on Reddit, I now have the subreddit r slash what the shell. There, I'll be posting each episode, and if you're around, we can discuss some of the intricacies of it, how I got to certain information, and why it's such a big deal. That's it for now. I'll see you in two weeks for the next episode.